On this Monday night, the commander in chief cleared to go home. The U.S. president's prognosis. He may not entirely be out of the woods yet. All the medications he's on and his message to the world as more of his inner circle become infected. Ontario's COVID-19 testing turmoil, the confusion and the crisis as Quebec reimposes even more rules. A Canadian orphan finally leaves a Syrian camp, the crucial role Canada's special forces played in securing her freedom. And the highest honours bestowed on an Alberta-based scientist. Everyone in Canada should be so grateful to Michael. The Nobel-winning work that saved millions of lives. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with the latest on President Trump, who has not fully recovered from COVID-19. He has just been discharged from the hospital. The president walked out of the Walter Reed Medical Center wearing a mask. He was only diagnosed Friday, so it's assumed he's still contagious. We're told he's still taking two drugs, including one that's usually given to people who are severely ill with COVID-19. He gave a thumbs up and was driven to the presidential helicopter, then flown to the south lawn of the White House, where an outbreak of COVID-19 continues to spread through his inner circle. Earlier today, Trump tweeted, I will be leaving the great Walter Reed Medical Center today at 6.30 p.m. Feeling really good. Don't be afraid of COVID. Don't let it dominate your life. I feel better than I did 20 years ago. Well, COVID-19 is not a youth serum and the virus is dominating his life and his administration, not to mention the families of the more than 210,000 Americans it has killed. Trump's press secretary, Kayleigh McEnany, is the latest on his staff to test positive for COVID-19. She's been briefing reporters as recently as yesterday without a mask. At least 14 people in Trump's inner circle are now known to be positive. This afternoon, his doctors agreed he was ready to be discharged, though he's still taking at least two medications. Over the past 24 hours, the president has continued to improve. He's met or exceeded all standard hospital discharge criteria. Our plan is to give the fourth dose of remdesivir this evening before he goes back to the White House, and we've made arrangements to deliver the fifth and final dose of his treatment course at the White House tomorrow evening. He continues on dexamethasone. Jackson Prosco is at the Walter Reed Medical Center where Trump just left. Jackson, Trump isn't cured. He still has COVID-19. And yet, what did he do as soon as he walked up the steps of the White House? Good evening to you, Donna. The president's release was essentially choreographed as almost a campaign ad. And as he walked up the steps of the White House, he paused on the balcony outside the White House doors and took off his mask. Remember, he is still likely infectious. And then he stepped into the White House maskless. This entire evening, though, really was made for the cameras. There were lights set up here on the steps of Walter Reed. His official photographer was seen with him on the balcony of the White House. And now he's heading inside where he tries to man manage a pandemic that has killed more than 210,000 Americans and has sickened many people, including him, within the White House. Shortly before being discharged from Walter Reed Medical Center, the president's doctors continued to paint a rosy picture of the world's most famous COVID-19 patient. Though he may not entirely be out of the woods yet, his clinical status support the president's safe return home. Despite Donald Trump's continued use of therapies typically reserved for severe cases of the virus, he will be allowed to recover at home, though he's likely still infectious and surrounded by a mountain of unanswered questions about his health. So you have to believe, given what we've seen this past four days, five days, that this is all to project an image. It's to project an image of not being vulnerable or to project an image that everything's okay. It's not clear if Trump's hospital departure may have been ill-advised. Experts see it as part of an epidemic of troubling behavior by the White House. 24 hours earlier, the president took a joyride past supporters and media outside the hospital, enclosing himself in an SUV with two Secret Service agents. You know, the reality is, is that this was a dangerous move. There is no medical benefit for this to have taken place. Um, it violates CDC guidelines that come from the president's own administration. There's now a growing cluster of cases connected directly to the executive mansion, including Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany and two of her aides. There. Despite her own close contact with confirmed cases, McEnany had chosen not to quarantine before her positive diagnosis and was still at work on Sunday where she briefed reporters without a mask. Yeah, I'm not going to give you a detailed readout with timestamps of every time the president's tested. 
She and Trump's doctors still refuse to say when the president last tested negative. A critical question that could shed light on whether Trump was infectious during the presidential debate with Joe Biden or the campaign rallies that followed. Biden says he's still open to future debates. If the scientists say that it's safe and the distances are safe, then I think that's fine. I'll do whatever the experts say is the appropriate thing to do. Back at the White House, at least three reporters and two House staff have come down with the virus. Several report having no contact from the White House and no attempt at contact tracing. While the White House has a fully functioning medical unit inside, it's not clear how they'll manage isolating a potentially infectious patient. One thing is clear, they will likely try and keep the president inside the residence and out of the West Wing. But Donna, as we've seen over the past few days, the president has little or no interest in following those types of guidelines or common sense. Donna? All right, Jackson Prosco, thank you. In Ottawa today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked when he was last tested for COVID-19. Earlier in September, I had a bit of a, uh, a bit of a throat tickle is probably the best way I could say it, a bit of a, a raspy throat. Um, so I checked with my doctor and he recommended I get tested. Uh, I got tested. Uh, it was negative. Um, and uh, I, uh, I went back to work uh, a few days later when the, when the doctor told me uh, I was clear to do it. Test results aren't coming back that quickly for everyone. There is a backlog of more than 65,000 tests in Ontario. It's taking up to a week to get results, and that's causing huge problems with contact tracing, which has to happen fast to break the chain of transmission. An average of 71,000 people in Canada were tested each day over the past seven days. 1.7% of them tested positive. Ontario and Quebec account for more than 80% of the new infections in this country. And this is the picture today. Quebec is reporting nearly 1,200 new cases, the fourth consecutive day of more than 1,000 new cases. Ontario has more than 600 reported today. Manitoba, 51. Alberta is recording more than 200 new cases. That's the second day in a row, a two-day tally that's not been seen since April. And B.C. has 120. And a hospital in D.C., the Delta Hospital, is now closed to new admissions as it deals with a COVID-19 outbreak. There are 35 confirmed cases and seven people have died. We are watching hospitalizations. Again, the numbers are highest in Ontario and Quebec, and they're slowly rising. An average of 585 people in Canada were in the hospital for COVID-19 on any given day during the last seven-day period. Canada's chief public health officer fears that will begin to rise because the virus is beginning to appear again inside long-term care homes, especially in Canada's two biggest provinces. That's a signal that you could get more hospitalizations and then later on mortality or, or death. So that is clearly something that you got to just immediately uh, prevent. Otherwise, the healthcare system is the next sort of frontier that might be overwhelmed and we want to prevent that. As of yesterday, at least 219 residents in long-term care in Quebec had COVID-19 and 124 residents in Ontario care homes. Quebec has reimposed restrictions in COVID-19 hotspots and Ontario is spending more money to try to keep schools safe. That doesn't address the strain on labs that do the testing and on the contact tracers. Abigail Beeman reports. So I have to go online. I didn't know. Confusion at this Ottawa test center closed until Tuesday as all centers in the province moved to online booking. Someone told you to come here? Yeah, from the doctor. We're working hard to make sure that the information is as clear as possible. Not clear enough for Fred Glode, waiting for a test as he cares for older relatives. Now, everybody's saying, well, they're doing their best. People are dying. It, doing your best isn't good enough. The testing regime is in crisis. The backlog is huge. Ontario-wide, we're over 90,000 backlog cases, and there is no obvious way to chip away at that before some of those specimens expire. The Prime Minister says federal labs are chipping in, but the numbers don't match. Including for Ontario for 1,000 tests a day. And additional federal labs will be added. On contact tracing, we have agreements in place with Ontario, Quebec and Alberta, with more to come for other provinces and territories. We could have another 700 people added to the ranks and still be unable to contact trace with the same reach and results as when infection rates were lower. Ontario's Premier announced $35 million for schools and hotspots. 
Quebec announced more restrictions in the province's three red zones, closing gyms, cancelling team sports and changes at schools, including mandatory masks for high school students. All the actions that we are taking today uh, could, could and should prevent the closing of schools. And on the global stage, a Canadian virologist is one of the newest Nobel laureates, and he's worried about Canada's manufacturing hole. We need the ability as a country to respond at the manufacturing level. That's I think COVID especially has highlighted a big deficiency in Canada's ability to respond to epidemics. Manufacturing for things like our own vaccines and tests. Monday, the Deputy Prime Minister promised the first shipments of rapid tests will arrive from the U.S. next week. And she promised more to announce on the rapid test front, quote, very soon. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Two new federal benefits are now available to Canadians. People who are forced to take time off work to care for a dependent because of the pandemic can apply for financial help. Mike LeCouture explains what's available and who qualifies. Bye-bye. Hello. Uh -oh. Playing with her eight-month-old daughter is a welcome break from the daily stress of COVID-19. Julia Wilson and her husband were self-employed but are now unemployed because of the pandemic. And Wilson can't work because her daughter was diagnosed with congenital thyroid disorder, meaning she can't go to daycare. Anything like a simple cold or anything, she, she won't be able to fight as well as others, which could land her in the hospital. It's why she had to apply for the new caregiver benefit, which started today. It will provide $500 per week for up to 26 weeks in households where one person missed more than half their work week because they have to care for a family member as a result of COVID-19. It's estimated 700,000 people will apply for it. Also starting today, paid sick leave. That will make up $500 per week for a maximum of two weeks for people who had contracted COVID-19 or had to isolate because they were exposed to the virus. The government believes nearly 4.5 million Canadians could benefit from it. That's a major victory for Canadian workers. And for Both of the new benefits were the result of negotiations with the NDP to keep the Liberal minority government afloat. The Conservatives point out there's a gap between the first wave of benefits and this one, blaming the Liberals if some Canadians fall through the cracks. We've said all along that prorogation actually wasted six valuable weeks when committees could have been uh, considering, discussing. The government contends no one will be left behind. Individuals will have to, first on the first uh, period, apply in arrears, uh, but then receive the funds automatically, and then ongoing from there, it's the same process. So they're really, in terms of the timing of the payments, uh, when it all comes out, it'll come out the same amount uh, for the same period of time. The application process for the replacement to the CERB, the Canada Recovery Benefit, which is for self-employed workers and those not eligible for EI, starts on October 12th, and it too will be paid in arrears two weeks at a time. Donna? Mike LeCouture, thanks. A little girl gets a chance at a new life in Canada. Coming up, the orphan on her way from a camp in Syria and how Canadian Special Forces helped. The pandemic has pushed lots of news out of the headlines, including the fate of thousands of people suspected of connections to the so-called Islamic State. They're confined to an overcrowded camp in northeastern Syria, both former ISIS fighters and their families, including at least 46 Canadians. One of them is a five-year-old named Amira. Her parents were killed in an airstrike, and her uncle back in Canada has been desperate to bring her here to give her a chance at a new life. Now, as Mike Drolet reports, it's finally happening. The al Hol detention camp in northern Syria has been described as horrific. Water and food are scarce, medicine as well. In the course of five days in, uh, in August, there were uh, eight children under five who, who died from you know, various issues related to uh, malnutrition and health-related conditions. This is where a five-year-old girl named Amira has lived since last year, after her parents and siblings were killed in the last battle to destroy ISIS. Amira has never set foot in Canada, but one of her parents, a suspected ISIS sympathizer, was Canadian. And now, Global News has learned Canadian Special Operations Forces, working on behalf of Global Affairs Canada, got her out of Syria. 
When she arrives in Canada, she'll live with her uncle and his family and become the first Canadian repatriated from the Syrian camps for ISIS detainees. For a five-year-old to try and put all of this together, it must be uh, earth-shattering. Uh, of course, she's going to be welcomed uh, when she arrives in, into the arms of her, her grandparents and her uncle and uh, uh, start a new life. Human Rights Watch says there are still 46 Canadians being held in the camp. Eight men, 13 women and 25 children. Most of the children are under the age of six. None has been brought before a judge or charged with a crime. Over 20 other countries have managed to repatriate their citizens from the camp, yet Canada has said it was too dangerous for consular officials to travel in northern Syria. It's a question of political will and the lack of political will to repatriate this specific group of Canadians who are detained in northeast Syria. When asked if Amira's return would open the door to others, Canadian officials maintained this was an exceptional case. Sometimes you got to give way to the, the politics and do the right thing. And I think this is a first step in doing the right thing. Um, and I'm really optimistic that this might lead to further action on behalf of the government. Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. Ahead, what medications is President Trump taking? We answer more of your COVID-19 questions. Anyone who tells you they know everything about COVID-19 is lying. There is much scientists and doctors still don't understand, but they are learning new things every day. Our Jeff Semple has been talking to experts and is here to answer some of your COVID-19 questions. Jeff? Well, Donna, Donald Trump's COVID-19 cocktail has some Canadians wondering whether that presidential treatment plan might be available here. Christelle wrote in to ask, is remdesivir currently available to COVID-19 patients in Canada? The answer is yes, but not for everyone. It's available um, mainly through the context of a trial or occasionally for compassionate use as well. Remdesivir is the first drug in Canada approved to treat COVID-19. The intravenous medication is expensive and in short supply, reserved for hospitalized patients. That drug doesn't save lives, but it can shorten the duration of hospital stay and make people get better more quickly. The president also received dexamethasone, a potentially risky steroid used in Canada to treat severe cases of COVID-19. He's the president of the United States, so they're going to throw the kitchen sink at him if they can justify it. October marks the start of flu season in our northern hemisphere. And Mary wrote in to ask, what are the main differences between COVID-19 symptoms and a regular cold or seasonal flu? Unfortunately, from a doctor's standpoint, it's almost impossible to separate the two. The symptom list overlaps quite a bit. The most common symptoms of COVID-19, a fever, dry cough and fatigue, are similar to the flu. But there are some subtle differences. With the flu, you're more likely to have a headache or muscle pain, while COVID-19 can affect your sense of smell or taste. A runny nose, meanwhile, is most likely a common cold. And speaking of noses, have you ever wondered whether it might be okay to slip your mask just south of the schnoz? I see a lot of people who actually wear a mask only on their mouth and not their nose. And I always wonder if that is actually the best way. The so-called half-maskers have become a source of controversy and for good reason. A recent study found the highest concentration of COVID-19 infection is in the nasal passages which is why wearing a mask below the nose is a no-no. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. Next, Canada's connection to a Nobel Prize decades in the making. A University of Alberta virologist is getting the ultimate recognition for a medical discovery made over 30 years ago. Dr. Michael Houghton has won the Nobel Prize in Medicine, along with two other researchers. They discovered the hepatitis C virus, and their work went on to save millions of lives. Heather Urich's West on the latest Nobel laureate with a Canadian connection. 30 years ago, Stephen Sheridan was sure hepatitis C would kill him. The virus made him so ill, he eventually required a liver transplant. I suffered with it for almost 14 years before I got my transplant. And then uh, to be cured, uh, that was beyond my wildest dreams. Today, Sheridan and millions of others around the world like him 
are living healthy lives free of the blood disease, thanks to the work this University of Alberta researcher began in 1982. An important lesson that I've learned is if you want to solve major problems, you've really got to be persistent. It took Dr. Michael Houghton and his colleagues nearly a decade to fix a problem that first came to light in the early 80s, when patients who had received tainted blood transfusions began to fall ill with a form of hepatitis unlike anything doctors had ever seen. Everyone in Canada should be so grateful to Michael because he is the person who discovered the virus that caused the tainted blood scandal that hit Canada very hard. Not only did Houghton's work lead to tests that could ensure the safety of Canada's blood supply, it also eventually led to the development of a drug, a cure for what had previously been a deadly disease. Before uh, people were getting infected, there were no, there was no treatment, and they were developing a variety of liver disease. Uh, and then um, some of those required liver transplantation. About five percent would develop liver cancer. Of course, the work for Houghton and his team is not done. He's now working on a vaccine for hepatitis C, while turning his attention to the COVID-19 fight as well. Hep C kills around 400,000 people every year. So far this year, COVID's killed around a million people. Um, so these virus viruses are really a permanent threat and we need diagnostics, we need antivirals and we need vaccines. And though it may be some time before this novel coronavirus is finally tamed, Stephen Sheridan is living proof of what can be done. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is these seaplanes docked in Vancouver's Cole Harbour. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.